Hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel Haberman. I am Skyward's Content Marketing Manager and I am joining you here in snowy Boston where we are in the midst of a blizzard. Uh, I've got Tom Gerace, uh Skyward CEO with me and then joining me on the phone we've also got Robert McKee. So Robert McKee you may know as the author of Story. Uh, he has made his mark largely in the screenwriting world as a lecturer on the craft of story. He has taught uh, 60, more than 60 at this point, Academy Award winners. Uh, but the reason that he is joining us today and talking to a group of marketers as opposed to a group of screenwriters is that after having taught this, um, after having taught his story seminar for gosh, at this point he's been doing that since uh, the 1980s, he started noticing that business people were attending and seeking to understand story. And so he partnered with Tom Gerace, founder and CEO of Skyward, uh, to start taking what he had learned from uh, the seminars he was teaching to screenwriters to an entirely different audience. So Tom is a serial entrepreneur. He has spent much of his career in the digital marketing space. Uh, he is currently the founder and CEO of Skyward, which is a software and services company uh, that helps solve the problems associated with the creation and management of original content. Um, but broadly, uh, what we are trying to do at Skyward is to support marketers in the shift to a content or rather story-centered marketing strategy. The reason that we are here today is to talk about their forthcoming book, Storynomics. Uh, we're going to spend a few more moments uh, going through an introduction and from there on we are going to go into something of a fireside chat. I'll be moderating a discussion between Bob and Tom. And then at the end, we are going to uh, an open Q&A. So you can use the chat box in the lower left-hand side of your screen to ask any questions that you have. I'd also like to remind you that if you are interested, you can follow along on Twitter using the hashtag Storynomics. So first of all, big question, what is Storynomics? What are we talking about? Because um, this is a term that will probably come up quite a few times in the course of this conversation. It's the title of the book. It's the title of the seminars that they teach together. Uh, and I'm going to pull directly from the introduction to the book itself where they call Storynomics story-centric business practices that lead to fiscal results. Uh, and they can get into that a little more throughout the course of our conversation, but that is the overall framing to keep in mind. Uh, I'd also like to remind everybody that we are a week out from the launch of this book. Um, you can order it uh, on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. It's already available for pre-order. And if that's not enough for you and you'd like to see them live, uh, you can go to the Storynomic Seminars. Uh, this is all places that we are holding them this spring here in the U.S. We've got L.A., D.C., New York, and Boston, and internationally we'll also be sending Bob and Tom to Moscow and Beijing. So we're all over the place. And with that, uh, we can go straight on into our discussion. So I want to start out by talking about the big pain that really I would say most marketers, if not all marketers, are feeling right now, which is to say that it is really, really hard to get people's attention. That's kind of what we're all struggling, what we're all fighting for. And you hear a lot of commentary on it. You know, we hear that people are more easily distracted or that attention spans are shrinking. I can say as a millennial myself, this is uh, something that gets lobbed at me every now and then. I'm not too fond of it. Um, and we know, right, we know as marketers that we need to be doing something differently. Um, you're saying that storytelling is that thing. And I guess I want to know why. So, Bob, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I too have heard this, of course, this accusation uh, that attention spans are shrinking. And uh, to me, that's, uh, it's all nonsense. Um, I mean, literally, if, if attention spans were to shrink, it would require change at the genetic level. But uh, human nature has not changed. Um, I mean, 
it, as far as attention spans are concerned, uh, people today binge, right? They watch TV series three, four, five hours back to back. And so what kind of a attention does that require? Uh, what has changed, actually, is that interest spans have shrunk. Um, <clears throat> you have to, um, the, the millennials or people today, generally, will, um, will not listen to something and pay attention to anything that does not interest them. Uh, there was a time in the past when as, uh, you marketers could count on people being polite. You'd put a commercial on television. Even if people didn't want to watch the commercial, they would sit there politely uh, thinking in some sense that, that they owed it to you to pay attention to your commercial because television was free and this was how you paid for it was watching commercials. Well, that day is gone. Nobody <clears throat> will listen to anything that a marketer has to say if they're not interested in it. And so the interest span then is what you've got to capture. Uh, the best way to do that is to tell a story, to put it in story form, uh, because story begins with a moment of change in some character's life that grabs the attention of an audience. The next thought they have after they witness this, this, this change <clears throat> um, is, how will this turn out? And so a story hooks attention or interest, better put, by arousing in the audience that question, now that this has gone <clears throat> awry for this character, how will this turn out? And their curiosity to get an answer to that question holds their interest uh, for as long as the story needs to. Um, and, so, um, and so I think for marketers, you should think in terms of hooking interest, holding interest, and today, story is the most effective way of doing that because bragging and promising, the way in which you used to uh, market just does not work anymore. People are not interested in hearing how big you are, good you are, shiny or new, and listening to your promises. They are very cynical. They don't trust that. Um, and so you've got to capture their interest with story. Tom, is there anything you want to add to that other than ouch? <laughs> No, I think, I think Bob has called out uh, the difference really well. I mean, if you wanted to understand why a lot of marketing videos are ignored and why consumers are willing to lend an entire evening to a Netflix series they love, it's really in, uh, first, whether or not the marketer is delivering an experience the consumer wanted in the first place, and second, whether or not they're delivering it well. Are they telling stories uh, well that are aligned with uh, the consumer's wants and, and the marketer's uh, goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, really at the center of that uh, is Storynomics. We've really designed the, the entire experience to help uh, marketers think about what their content strategy, what their storytelling strategy should be, uh, how to understand story form and craft good stories, and then how to craft the specific stories they need to to drive the business results they seek. Mm -hmm. So let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, storytelling is kind of the word in marketing right now. Um, I, you don't have to go far to find some rather cynical commentary saying this is kind of stuff and nonsense and a lot of fluff and what difference does it make? And to an extent, I understand that point, right, because I see a lot of people saying this is storytelling, but it looks just like content. So. What then is the difference here? What, what is content? What is story? And what are you saying differently with Storynomics that we're not hearing from you know, other commentators about storytelling? Yeah, it's not just the most, one of the most used terms today. I think it's one of the most misused terms today because you'll see people that are, that are trying to jump on the story bandwagon as, as more and more uh, I think senior level marketers become aware of the power of storytelling. Uh, and they will just try to reframe what they've been doing uh, in a uh, story description. Uh, however, most of those folks don't actually understand what story is. And Mr. McKee, since you've spent your career helping people understand what story is and, and how it's different from uh, content generally, maybe I will pass the ball to you to, uh, to explain the difference. 
Well, it, uh, if in the general, most broadest sense, uh, content simply means information, means knowledge, um, <clears throat> then content is not story. I mean, you can build a story out of that content, out of that knowledge, but it has to be put dynamically into a story form. Uh, one of the reasons um, there's this, there is confusion about this is because uh, people, marketers really don't understand the difference between narrative and story. Often the market will say, well, we tried storytelling and it really didn't work. Well, the truth is they didn't actually tell a story. Uh, they think they did, but what they told is a narrative. And um, uh, people like that word narrative because it's got three syllables and it sounds uh, academic or scientific, uh, but it, it commits a, a categorical error. Um, all stories are narratives, but not all narratives are stories. Uh, so for example, uh, a process is not a story. All the uh, components of an automobile going down an assembly line, being pieced together bit by bit and turning into a car is not a story. It's a narrative. I mean, it's like a story. It has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, but and then and then and then uh, <clears throat> chronologies, lists. Uh, sometimes when I'm working with a client, I'll ask them uh, <clears throat> to uh, describe, tell the story of their company, and what they give me is the um, the uh, organizational chart. Uh, <clears throat> pyramids of power like that are not stories. All of those are, are narratives. Um, and so the, um, they have to take the content, whatever information they're trying to impart, and they have to learn how to put it in a dynamically storified form uh, to capture and hold and pay off and move people to action. And so it's not just a matter of, um, of telling <clears throat> any story. Uh, any narrative. You have to tell a story and you have to tell it, um, you have to tell it with great skill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I want to dig into that a little bit more um, because I think we still haven't gotten at that, that last part of the question, which is what makes Storynomics specifically different from the storytelling advice that is out there for marketers right now? Tom, do you want to take that? I'm not sure that I understood the question. What okay. makes the Storytomics advice? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay. So, well, I mean, versus other seminars you might get on storytelling. Yeah. You know, yeah, Bob and I have had the opportunity to, to listen into a couple of seminars. One of the things that I think we found is that many of the folks that are teaching or, or, or profess to teach uh, storytelling actually don't understand the form. Uh, you know, there is a, there is a form uh, to story, like there's a form or a craft uh, to painting. Uh, or to composing music. And uh, teaching that form is essential. And we don't have time to, to go into that today. Uh, certainly do in the book and the seminar, but we, we don't have time to go into that in an hour today. But there's a, there's a form to it. For example, if you were painting uh, and you didn't understand how to paint with perspective, as thousands of painters leading into the Renaissance did not, uh, your paintings would not have been nearly as good as a result. But today we can teach every fifth grade art student how perspective works. And with practice over time, they become much better artists because they're taught the craft. Well, I think what we see out there is, is really people are trying to give content marketing seminar 101s, and they don't understand or at least don't share what story is in those seminars. And so they leave the audience thinking they have learned story craft when in fact uh, they haven't heard about it at all. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying then is that content marketing is sort of being called story, but it's not necessarily true? That's right. Yeah. I, I think it is really folks that were doing the thing yesterday that are trying to claim to do the next thing, uh, but yet haven't updated, updated their approach. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, it's, so, a, it's, it's much of what, a, you know, what I was alluding to before. When, when you're at lunch, for example, and somebody is telling you a story, and boring the bejesus out of you, the truth is they're not telling you a story. They're telling you a narrative. It's probably just a list of every accomplishment they've ever had in their life 
and it's and then and then I did this and I did that, and it, it's just a list through time. Um, it, it's not a true story. A true story begins with an event that radically upsets the balance of life. And um, a list does not do that. And so the, the form that Tom is talking about is a, is a precise uh, form that, that, um, that we teach in the book and in the lecture um, that fits the mind. I mean, if, if you were actually at lunch being told a true story, you'd be fascinated. And so um, a story hooks interest. It hooks curiosity. It hooks emotional involvement. And it draws a person in and it makes time vanish as you sit there fascinated, uh, involved, and wondering how is this going to turn out. Um, and that is done in a, with, a, with a very <clears throat> precise uh, form that, that, you, that the mind <clears throat> understands instinctively and immediately and it knows the difference between uh, narrative and story, and, and it grabs the, the interest when it's a, a true story. And so it's, very, it's fundamental for, 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 um, for marketers to come to understand this, this form and how it dynamically grabs and hooks and holds and pays off uh, interest and attention. And most importantly, it moves people to act. I mean, what we, what we um, teach in the, in the lecture and uh, what we put into the book is what we call the purpose-told story. It, it, it holds attention, therefore, in some sense, it's entertaining. But it's, not, its purpose is not to entertain. Its purpose is to uh, cause people to uh, go out into the world and purchase a product or hire a service. Uh, and, the, and if they don't do that, then the, the, the story is worthless. And so um, a marketing story uh, delivers uh, 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 an audience uh, to the marketplace and, and causes them to do what you need them to do. Um, and so um, the, the marketing story is a very precise instrument uh, whose purpose is uh, purchases of one kind or another, or in a branding exercise, at least a change in the consumer's mind. The first step is to get them to see the brand in a positive way that leans them toward a purchase. Um, and so you've got to cause people to do something, even if it's just to change their attitude or their mind from, from neutral to positive. Uh, and so it's, it's an instrument for change. Uh, in the, in, and um, uh, you've got to master the, the components of that to do it really effectively. Mm -hmm. mm. So. Can you give me an example? I mean, that something that you've seen recently that um, you know much of the audience would be familiar with? A brand that has done this brilliantly. Hmm. Uh, most recently, I'd say I'm in love with Bud Light's Dilly Dilly campaign. <laughs> okay, it, it's just terrific. There's a it, it moves. It's dynamic. It moves from the negative to the positive. Okay. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're outnumbered 20 to 1, this ragtag army up against this very efficient army. Um, and so it sets what's critical, one of the components of any you know, really effectively told story is it sets the negative floor. They are outnumbered 20 to 1, right? And he's got to turn, <laughs> the protagonist of the story uh, has to turn his army <clears throat> into, um, into uh, killers. And uh, how does he do it? He says, we are out of Bud Light, but the enemy has Bud Light. Um, that's a wonderful piece of storytelling. Uh, and, um, uh, and they've done this, this whole variations on all these medieval settings. Um, and they, they, and it's, a, it's, it's comic, of course, and so it's pleasurable that way. But it dramatizes, it storifies uh, the uh, the need for the pleasure the Bud Light delivers, um, and so they're doing <laughs> they're doing that extremely well. I don't, uh, uh, and of course yes, and I've seen uh, imitations already of um, of uh, Bud Light's successful Dilly Dilly, and I'm sure that you know the Dilly Dilly is now become you know a catchphrase in um, in hip society somewhere, young people's uh, 
in that in that uh, in that market. So um, uh, the and the the form is ideal. There's a problem. We're being attacked by an enemy that has turned things to the negative. Now the story's got to find a way to move toward the positive and do it in a way that will motivate people to act and buy Bud Light. And um, it's simple on one hand, uh, but there's genius uh, in whoever created that campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I have to say, I must not be very hip because I have yet to adopt the catchphrase dilly dilly. Um, <laughs> so I want to pass this over to you, Tom. That was an example of uh, you know, a TV spot, but what about other forms? Um, could you tell a story in something shorter? Could you do it in a, in a print campaign? Could you sure. do it in an article online? Sure. Could you do it in you know, the kind of content that uh, is not necessarily a spot on the Super Bowl? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, story form uh, crosses uh, different media types, and it, and it remains essentially the same form. Uh, your ability to craft that story may vary based on, based on the format, but we've seen, let, let me give you the simplest example, uh, and one that we use in the seminar. We, uh, there's a brilliant single photograph uh, that is used as a print ad uh, in the London subway that shows a man uh, yelling effectively, mouth wide open, and a fist protruding from his mouth. And it connects with the jaw of a young woman standing next to him, and her head throws back from the impact. And it's really a disturbing image. You can't look away from it. Uh, and of course, you don't want to look at it. It's, it. it's showing somebody being hurt. But you know, Bob, Bob has mentioned many times uh, over the years that the mind is a story-making and storytelling machine. And one of the things it does, this image captures just a tiny moment in a story. It captures that in what Bob described earlier, the inciting incident that throws life uh, for the woman pictured out of balance. Um, but your mind fills in the gaps. You know she was okay before that moment, and you know she's injured after. And you automatically talk about this, in this case, uh, her life going from the positive to the negative, and being a good human being, you want to prevent that. And so what they've just done is create an emotion in your mind that is negative toward the activity happening in that photograph, and then they close the loop with the text at the bottom which says, verbal abuse can do just as much harm as physical. And so as people are frustrated at the end of their day, they are headed home to their spouse, they are perhaps in a bad mood from all of the things that happened to work. At work, they're reminded, maybe tone it down a little bit. Maybe be thoughtful and kind and not take my own frustrations out on the people I love. It's a really, really powerful campaign that uh, won a number of awards in Europe, and that's a single photograph. Well, that's a photograph that can work in a subway. It can work on a billboard. Those kinds of photographs are great storytelling vehicles in places like Instagram uh, or other social channels where it's going to be the image that captures attention uh, if you don't want to spend the capital to drive, uh, to, to create videos uh, to do the same in those uh, networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um, it takes um, a great deal of um, psychological insight on the part of a marketer uh, to understand uh, how story can work implicitly as well as explicitly. And so the, uh, the Bud Light uh, Dilly Dilly campaign tells explicit stories. There's a negative floor dynamically turning to the positive, but there's also, of course, because the mind is so receptive to story, implicit stories uh, that Tom just mentioned, for example. Um, a famous one um, is the, um, the Michelin tire image of a baby in a tire. Uh, that single image creates a, a story that runs through the, uh, the, the mind the moment you glance at that baby in the tire. And the story goes like this. Um, I'm driving in a <clears throat> uh, rainy, stormy night, my family in the back seat, my child in the back seat, uh, and uh, suddenly a truck in front of me or something happens that um, causes me to veer uh, uh, onto the shoulder perhaps, um, and I... 
but my tires grip the road, and I get uh, safely around uh, the, um, the disaster in front of me, and I save my family's life. My baby is safe thanks to Michelin tires. And so there's an instantaneous story that runs through the mind when you see an image like that, and that's why that Michelin tire ad uh, took this obscure French tire company into the international market. Um, but you can't create an implicit effective story like that encapsulated in a single image until you understand the nature of story and the scenario that you want to run through the audience's or the viewer's mind when you project that. Um, another famous one is the Nike uh, just do it uh, phrase. Just do it is a powerful implicit story about somebody who goes from out of shape to in shape uh, and all the, the pain in between. Uh, but to achieve that kind of concentration of storytelling in a single image, uh, you first of all have to have the psychological insight as to how stories work uh, and, um, and uh, be able to um, compress one inside of that image. Uh, takes um, uh, a lot of um, uh, great creativity based upon a knowledge of what a story is and how you can um, explicitly or implicitly uh, create one that will be effective. Yeah. So you, um, you, know, you paint a great picture of why this is necessary. Um, at the same time, it kind of seems like a pretty tall order for marketers. I mean, I will say, speaking as a marketer, like, this seems like a lot to me. And also, you know, knowing that you have worked with you know, some of the greatest storytellers in the entertainment industry today, this feels a little intimidating. Um, it should it you, should feel intimidating because yeah. it, 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 it's based upon a revolution in, your, in the marketer's logic. You have to change the way you think. Traditional marketing is based upon uh, <clears throat> uh, bragging and uh, promising, what you know called features and benefits. And so you look at the product or the service, and you, <clears throat> you look at the features, and you brag about that, and then you um, <clears throat> uh, uh, promise uh, what it will do, the benefits that it will give the um, consumer. And, <clears throat> and that is a rational logic. Here are the features. These are the benefits. We bring these out. We brag about them. We promise. Uh, that is the traditional logic. That logic has to be re redone from, from scratch. You have to be able to think about how taking that content, those features and benefits, and thinking in a storified way. And so it is intimidating um, because it's, it's, it's a revolution in the way in which you have to think. And so what the marketer <coughs> realizes or should realize is that they're going to have to gather talented people who know this storified way of thinking and who can create in a storified way. Uh, and that means that the marketer then has to imagine themselves or become, in fact, a producer. <clears throat> if they're producing a, a, a feature film, uh, they gather the talented people, the writer, the director, the actors, and they gather these talented people who will then uh, produce uh, this storified uh, 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 work. And, um, and so they're going to have to um, be, develop their understanding of story so that they can pick the right talent, so they can guide that talent, and at the end of the day produce uh, <clears throat> messages that have a powerful, gripping hook uh, to them and that compel interest and hold it and move people to act. And so the producer then has to begin to think of themselves, I mean the marketer, has to begin to think of themselves as a producer. Uh, they have to gather the talent and to guide that talent to success. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so Tom, I want to kick this over to you. Can you explain how you see these stories fitting into a company's marketing strategy? Right? Do you need to have an overarching story? Do you need to put every single piece of content that you create into a story form? How does this fit together? 
Thanks, Rachel. Well, we see, we see uh, really a sea change happening in the world of marketing. I mean, for the better part of 200 years, marketers were optimizers. They were effectively charged with making advertising and communications approaches a little better every year. You know, different markets, different targeting capabilities, but it was the same basic approach uh, year after year after year. But today, marketers are not in the role of optimizer any longer. We are shifting from an interruption-focused culture in B2C or B2B. I mean, we've talked a lot about the advertising world and the, the changes happening there. And uh, you can see now the changes we forecasted two or three years ago uh, coming true today. WPP stock, the largest media buyer, is off by 33%. Netflix stock providing 50 billion hours of ad-free content a year is up to its all-time high on the same week. But realizing, and by the way, this is true in B2B. We use B2C examples various times, but think about the interruption in B2B. When's the last time you picked up a phone call where you didn't know who was calling instead of letting it go into voicemail? Or, or when you sit down at your desk and you get direct mail, it used to be a huge way to get to B2B audiences. What do you do? You sort through anything that is not a bill or a check and drop it right in the trash. I mean, do you even flip through the stuff you get or even open those envelopes any longer? I mean, and, and it goes on and on and on. So we have moved beyond where those traditional methods worked to where we have to, as marketers, earn the attention of our audience. So story has to be at the center of all of these, of all of your new marketing approaches. And what that requires as a CMO is you've got to go in and educate your team about this change, that the world is different and the approach has to be different. And of course, through Storynomics, Bob and I are, are working to provide uh, methods of assisting with that education. You've got to then develop a completely different marketing strategy. And that marketing strategy has to recognize that you're going to be in an always-on, original storytelling mode, and that you're then going to distribute these stories down many different channels, whether those are your website, email, social channels, YouTube, whatever different, uh, through marketing automation, whatever different ways you have of connecting with your customers. You're going to have to, once you've got that strategy in place, uh, then develop different operations. So there are going to be different software platforms. Obviously, in my day job, I focus on building one of those at Skyward. You're going to have different marketing practices and your team will need different training. And then as we talk about uh, in the book at the end, you know, the role of the CMO often goes from being the content creator when brands were creating a little bit of content about themselves in the old days, to being the showrunner. And the last ingredient you're going to need is access to a broad talent pool of, ex of very talented storytellers uh, in every form, photographers, videographers, uh, writers, of course. Uh, and when you've got that new approach and organization in place, then you're equipped to take your marketing uh, successfully in a direction that will win in a search and socially driven world. So what do you think is keeping people from doing this? I mean, why not? It makes a lot of sense. What is keeping brands from embracing the shift? I'll just back up a moment and talk about uh, a survey that, that we uh, did at Skyward. We spent 2017 um, doing a, a survey of 1,000 content marketers from all over the world, and we released a report uh, in January. And one of the things we found when we asked, you know, to what extent has your organization embraced brand storytelling, uh, only 10% of those respondents said, that that's something that is embraced throughout our organization. And, and that's looking specifically at content marketers who are already predisposed to be thinking about this, and also people who are already interacting with Skyward who are probably already interested in brand storytelling. So we probably even have a, a better representation of people who have embraced hmm. brand storytelling there. How is it that only 10% have made this shift, and what are the barriers that are keeping people from doing it? Tom, do you want to start? <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I, I think back to, and Bob, forgive me for the paraphrase, but I remember you open your story lecture by saying, you know, if you want to understand, you, you need to begin with the premise that this is not easy. And if you understand how difficult it is, you've got some of the most talented folks in LA with some of the biggest budgets in the world creating stories, 
and you get some of the crap that we see on the big screen today, right? Did I do okay with that paraphrase, Bob? Yeah, it's, um, it's uh, you know, many are called, few are chosen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and so I think, you know, a lot, I, I think that it is different from what folks have, have done. So the first, probably the first reason folks don't jump in, Rachel, is it requires different knowledge. It requires different skills, and it, it's going to mean change, and that is scary uh, to people. Now, at the same time, uh, the old way is ending, so it's, uh, it, 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 we are hitting the moment where it is adapt or die for marketers. And so it can be as scary as you want, but the, it, it is something that marketers, if they want to be successful, and the brands that employ them, if they want to be successful, will learn to do. Um, so I think the first thing is, is recognizing that it's different from what they've been doing. So they do have to develop knowledge and skills and get out there and practice. But the other thing I think is, that is challenging is that they really do not understand story form. Uh, and we, we will walk into organization after organization after organization that think they know what it means. And we find that they do not know what it means. And during the, the workshops we put on, uh, Bob and I will occasionally be asked to, in, uh, to go into a large corporation and to do a custom uh, story training. We do rehearsals up on stage. And these are with marketing teams that think they are telling stories. And they will enter the room uh, not really telling stories. And they'll leave the room knowing how to do it and being excited about practicing that. Well, that's really about lear learning story form in the first place and then having a few shots at putting it to work so they can sense the difference. You can sense the different energy in the room once you do this a few times out there. So what... What I think I hear you saying is that people are starting to understand why, but they don't yet necessarily know how. I think, no, I think there's, a, I, I I think there's another there's another there's another facet to all of this. Um, <clears throat> I think business in general feels that they have a choice between science and story and they prefer science because science is solid and it, you, know, it's, they, you think rational and, uh, and then you have access now to mega data um, and that you know, the data is the big <clears throat> powerful uh, movement now toward that. And there, so if you get enough data and you hone that data down and sharpen your market and, um, and find a, on scale a way to bombard that market with uh, an image or uh, <clears throat> a quick message or whatever, a brag, a uh, promise, uh, that, that, that science is going to save you. And, um, and that story sounds soft and it sounds subjective and it sounds slippery and uncontrollable. And so there's a natural uh, prejudice towards science. And um, what Tom and I are trying to do is help the marketers understand that story is science, that the mind naturally, instinctively can create, create stories at every moment of its day, and that, that the natural fit into the mind of the, uh, uh, of the market is through storytelling, and that there's tremendous science based upon um, the natural, the way in which uh, story fits the mind, and so neuroscience has been teaching this for 40 years, uh, and so we're, 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 there's a marriage between science and story that marketers can can seize upon, and uh, in order to persuade the people in the C-suites that in fact story is science, uh, but it's an uphill battle. Great. Right. I think that this is a good place then to move into uh, open Q&A. Uh, I invite everybody to use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen to um, put forward any questions. We've actually got a couple that people have been putting in throughout uh, the discussion, and one of the couple of people have raised is, can you give us examples of great storytelling that's happening from the, in the world of B2B? I think it's very easy to come up with you know, B2C examples because we're bombarded by B2C advertising. But yeah. what about B2B? You want to start? You know, one of our favorites is Adobe. Um, and I think uh, if you take a step back and say Adobe is a software company, right? they could have taken the same approach that the vast majority of software company, companies out there uh, take, which is to name a problem and name the 
features and benefits they have that will, salute, you know, that will solve a user's problem um, and talk about themselves all day. But what Adobe does, I think, is absolutely brilliant. They tell stories in each of their ads. Uh, we use the uh, uh, encyclopedia example in our seminar. Uh, I think it's called Click Baby Click if you want to Google that. So. Uh, but it's a brilliant story told about an encyclopedia company and nowhere in it do they mention Adobe's marketing software until the very end after uh, the screen fades to white and uh, you understand the outcome of that story for this poor encyclopedia maker because they did not, in fact, use Adobe's software. Uh, you know, you get the, the, one of the things that is so powerful about storytelling is that it not only educates or informs an audience by passing along, as Bob talked about, certain facts about the universe that, that you would get from just content, but because it dramatizes them, it has the ability to, to deliver an emotional experience. It does well done, deliver an emotional experience to the audience. And we like to think of ourselves as rational buyers, but we are in no way rational buyers. I mean, we don't have time to get into it today, but the neuroscience shows again and again and again in our personal lives and in our business lives, we buy uh, largely based on emotion, gut instinct, what feels right to us. And knowing that, Adobe does something really powerfully uh, when they tell these stories because they make you feel something about Adobe software. They make you feel something about the Adobe brand. Well, most software makers out there aren't making you feel anything at all. And if you want to see another attempt at, uh, at brand storytelling that we, we are proud of, uh, you can check out the brand new homepage at Skyward. You'll see above the fold uh, a wedding story that we have told uh, at skyward.com, uh, which uh, does, we hope, the same thing uh, for our company. That's a very nice plot. There you go. Well done. Uh, Bob, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, if, if, you know, if you're looking at, uh, for example, a salesperson um, going in to um, um, <clears throat> make a pitch uh, to somebody who's um, you know, a purchaser, um, the way you use story in situations like that, B2B, <laughs> Um, is you, you look at the person who, and the company that's going to make this purchase and you analyze their current situation as if it were a story. And you look at that company and the, the person you're talking to is going to make this purchase and you, you understand their living experience beginning with the, the inciting incident, an event that has upset the balance within this company an event that has affected, therefore, the person you're talking to and has established a negative floor for this company and your product or your service that you're selling is the way, is the means by which they will move from the negative to the positive. And so you take mm -hmm. the story form and you apply mm -hmm. it to the living experience of the company, that uh, the business that you're trying to uh, market to, uh, and and using that form, then you understand uh, the the um, the, uh, the story that's living inside of the company that you're talking to, and you use that story then to um, uh, to uh, to take them uh, from wherever they are to a better place. Uh, and so, understanding story form as it lives in the reality of the company you are trying to market to. Um, is a huge uh, advantage uh, for you to be able to um, to show how your product or your service will fit the needs of that um, of that um, uh, purchaser. Um, and so, story form is a way of thinking that um, uh, one business can use to talk to another business. This is interesting to me because it actually isn't all that far from what we have been classically trained to do in some ways, right? Because it seems like this inciting incident is a way of talking about customer pain points, and you're then sort of translating that into story form. It makes a lot of intuitive sense. 
It does, but you think about how rare it is. I mean, yeah. how, you know, how many emails do you get a day that say, hey, can I have five minutes of your time? I want to tell you about my product. This is what we're doing, and we've had a lot of success with these people. It, yeah, a lot. <laughs> you know, and what do you do with those emails? You, you delete them, right, with prejudice. It's like, forget it. And, and if you're really angry, you, you mark them as spam so they don't arrive in the mailboxes of others. Mm-hmm. You know, what Bob just described is, is how a very good sales rep would, uh, would act, which is doing market research first about the industry where their prospect plays, diving into that prospect and reading all of the things that are being published about them and said about them in the industry and, and their latest financial results and how they're doing. And yeah, it's going to take time. I mean, good story craft is work. You have to do the research. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then coming in and writing that first line so that it's not, this is about me but that that first line comes out and says, uh, Dear Tricia, uh, I know that your company uh, missed its last quarter. That has to put you and the marketing team under tremendous pressure. Uh, And I suspect that your board's immediate response was to say, we need to cut the marketing budget to make the bottom line. But you know that if we do that, if you do that, you will miss the top line for the next three quarters to come. We can help make your marketing, uh, more, your marketing spend more efficient, allowing you to get more from your marketing dollar, preserving your, hitting that top line while preserving uh, the opportunity for future quarters. So if you, ha- if you start off in that way, you've got Trisha on the hook. You've taken her to the negative like Bob talked about, and then you hinted how you can take her to the positive. Then you're a lot more likely to get a response from that person you're reaching out to. But you're right, it did require you to get to know their business instead of just sending out a thousand identical emails, hoping that if you bombard enough people, one of them will eventually reply. Mm -hmm. All right, so I want to move on to another question. Uh, And we'll say this is a very marketing question. Um, How do you measure effective storytelling? Uh, And they've also added in parentheses, please don't say leads. Well, look, I think... You can't measure effective storytelling until you know what your goal is with the storytelling. Uh, We break down the uh, different goals uh, that marketers might have in their storytelling uh, into uh, three macro buckets when they're talking about storytelling outside the enterprise. Uh, The first is is building brand. And uh, this is probably one of the great challenges for marketers today is being able to get the, the executive team uh, to, particularly the CEO and CFO, to believe that they should be building, investing in building brands, building a differentiated brand. It's hard because uh, those efforts take longer to show up in the financial results, and uh, they can be harder to track through the specific ROI. Uh, but building brand is one of the key aspects that we think one of the great aspects, one of the great opportunities with storytelling that can lead to long-term, uh, much high, much greater financial results. But we can dive into these individually if folks are interested. So if you set out to build brand uh, with your customers, you're going to look first at whether or not they are engaging with your stories. Are they spending time consuming them? Are they coming back for more? What's the organic return rate to your work? Are they sharing those stories down their social channels so that they thought that they were Uh, good work that was worth uh, passing along to their friends, family, or colleagues. Um, We're going to also do, uh, we're going to do brand awareness and brand affinity surveys. So you're going to look at who is senior storytelling and what they feel about your brand and compare it with audiences that are surveyed that have not seen the stories you've shared uh, and look at how they see uh, your brand, and look at whether or not they remember it. Those that have seen your stories are remembering it, remembering it more positively than those who have not. If your goal is demand gen or lead generation, then uh, to our writer, I'm sorry, we are going to say that in the end you're going to measure uh, the results there with the number of times the cash register rings, the number of times the sales rec- reps get to take a meeting, uh, because you're setting out to drive that demand gen or lead gen. And certainly, uh, that is the right way to measure that uh, that set of uh, stories. Uh, and you're going to look at the number of leads they drive, 
of course, the cost per lead, and also, really importantly, the value per lead. Because if you're doing a good job at driving uh, leads into a channel with storytelling, you're going to come in with customers who are not only more likely to buy from you, but who are willing to buy more when they do. And then finally, we're going to look at the sales stories that Bob uh, spoke about just a few minutes ago. Uh, there you're going to look at close rate. Uh, you're going to look at the number of times the sales rep gets the meeting set up, uh, the number of times that they have follow-on meetings, and the number of times they close that deal, and of course the average uh, value of that deal. Uh, Bob's uh, uh, longtime client at Bolt uh, will tell you that uh, using story in their sales strategy in the B2B space had a transformative effect on their company. Uh, we talk a little bit about that in the uh, seminar as well. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one more question. Bob, I want to toss this over to you. Um, one of our li listeners asked, how do you go about that process of figuring out what's going to resonate with the audience before you go into the story time process? Uh, well, that's the, that's the first step um, of the eight steps of uh, designing a story. The first two steps are research, and the very first step is figuring out who your target audience is. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, you've got lots of help with that, with the data uh, available today on the demographics of, um, of your audience. So you have to understand who they are. And once you've um, focused on that, then the, the key question is, what do they need? Where does it hurt? Uh, what, do they, what do these people need or want uh, consciously, what do they think they want, uh, and uh, often, very importantly, what do they actually want that they're not even uh, conscious of. Uh, and be able, be identifying the need or the desire within the audience uh, is a huge first step. And that requires, again, some imagination and some insight to be able to see through the surface of people to identify uh, what they deeply need. And then the third step of that in, is to uh, answer the question, what do we want these people to do? Uh, do we want to change their mind? <clears throat> do we want to change their behavior? Do we want them uh, to purchase, um, et cetera? What exactly do we want them to do? So understanding who they are, what they need or want, where the pain is in their life that you're going to um, alleviate, and what action you want them to take. Those three steps define uh, the targets of the story. Uh, and, uh, and so the story then, as I said, is purpose told. It's an instrument uh, aimed at those people to satisfy that need and to cause that action in the, in the, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, and uh, so the, the a story isn't just any old uh, <clears throat> soft um, narrative about uh, the quality of a product or whatever, but it has to be very precise and aimed at a, at a, at a very specific action that you want people to take. Thank you. Um, we have so many questions from the chat box that we cannot get to in the interest of time, um, but I want to invite everybody to continue the conversation on Twitter. Uh, as I said earlier, use the hashtag Storynomics. You can tweet at Bob, at Mickey Story. You can tweet at Tom, at Tom Gerace. Um, I want to give both of you an opportunity for some final closing words of wisdom. Bob, you want to go first? A word of wisdom? <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, we're just wishing everybody luck. What do you want? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I, 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 there's lots of, um, there's lots of uh, thoughts that, uh, that are flying around uh, what we've been talking about. Uh, but I think the most important one of all is to recognize uh, the, that the future is not the past and that they are going to have to change. And they're going to have to compete with people who are willing to change. And I know the way in which cultures uh, hold you back and um, uh, people are, are uh, avoiding you know, risk. They don't want to have to take chances. They don't 
they <clears throat> they want to stay with what's tra tried and true. Um, but um, the truth is that in the future, uh, the um, the culture is a, is is undergoing a huge revolution, and that they uh, they've got to make up their mind whether or not they're going to um, <clears throat> take the chance uh, and find a, a a whole new methodology of thought and execution uh, in their marketing, uh, because uh, as a if you don't, there are people who will. Tom, anything to add to that? You know, I think um, what Bob just said is absolutely right, but I think the, the other way I look at it is that if you do, the opportunity is really pretty extraordinary because if you recognize that most folks will be slower to change and most people will not take the time to learn the craft and most people will not be able as a result to tell stories that hook, hold, and reward audience attention and then move people to act, what that means is that those that do will really break out. They will become the brands we love. They will become the brands we share. They will become the brands that we identify with over time. And they'll, of course, become the ones that we buy from. And so I think we're at this really exciting moment of, uh, of change in the universe. But people that act decisively and do this particularly well and invest in doing it well over the long term have a unique opportunity that only comes around during these times of tremendous change uh, to really build their, their companies and to stand out as leaders in their profession uh, when they do. I think that that is a really lovely place to wrap it up. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody who was on our call today. Um, if you want more information about the book, about the seminars, you can go to storynomics.com. Uh, and please also check your email because one person on the call was entered to win a free pass to Forward, which is our annual brand storytelling conference in Boston in June. So one more time, storynomics.com. You can find info about where you can get the book. You can get information about the seminars. And of course, you can always reach out to Skyward. Learn more at skyward.com. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.